yeah. All right, to the lesson, Colossians 3. It's related. Um, we're wrapping up the section that runs from like 12 to 17, and we're heading into um, new material today. So the whole thing that's on your sheet there has to do with truths to believe and then how our, what our responses were. So there were at the beginning of the chapter, there were we were raised with Christ, we died with him and so forth, and then there's a bunch of things to put off, a bunch of sins and stuff to put off. And then we've got good news in verse 12 that we're elect of God, holy and beloved. We, we're, he, we, we are his children. He cares for us. Therefore, put on all these things. Put on mercy. Put on kindness. That's in verse 12. And there's a whole list that we've been through now. We got to verse 17 of that section. Still, what are these things we're putting on? He says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So that's another fruit, an outpouring of having these, of the truth of who we are and what God has done for us. And now without skipping a beat, he jumps into family. Now, I don't know, in your Bible, mine's got a gap there with a, with a title in there. Mine says, between verse 17 and 18, mine says, the Christian home. But Paul didn't write that. Somebody decided to write that in there. And you all know, right, that the chapter numbers weren't even in the original at all. And um, so they're all just added by people to help make things easier. Can you imagine having a whole New Testament with no verse numbers and no book numbers? That's kind of hard to figure out. You all have to have the same, same exact Bible, so we at least could say it's be on page 573 and we would know where we were. Um, but this is all part of the same thing, the outflowing then of who God is and what he's done for us and how he loves us and cares about us and who we are in relationship to him as his children, his loved ones, and so forth. We get into verse 18, which starts with the family. Wives is the first one listed here. Now, what I'm, gonna, what I'm hoping to do here is to flip back and forth between Colossians and Ephesians because they're parallel. So we're going to be in Ephesians 5. So if you want to... Hold, we're going to start with Colossians where we are, but get your finger in Ephesians 5 so that you can flip back and forth with me, okay? I'll see how fast I can go back and forth and totally confuse you. All right, so he says in verse 18, Colossians 3:18, Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. So he gives us that one verse to wives, and then the next verse starts with husbands, okay? So we're going to talk about the wives first. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now, if you switch back to Ephesians 5, hold both places. We're going to be in 522. 522. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. And he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Okay? So, the question is, how much subject should wives be to their husbands? It says in everything. I was telling Sherry here before, I, I counseled with a man who took that very literally and abandoned a lot of other verses to Christians in general and to men about how to treat your wife, how to, um, you know, his, his idea was, um, I don't... She's got, to, she's got to submit to me. I, have to, I tell her what to do, and she does it. Well, there's, it says, some wives, submit yourselves to your husbands. But it also says to husbands a lot of other things, and to people in general, put other people first. Don't think about yourself only. Don't be selfish. All of those kinds of things. So you got to, there's a balance here, all right? Um, so I told him that, and he said, well, you're being too, too legalistic. Okay. So being... <coughs> Keeping your wife in submission isn't legalistic? I mean, I don't know. Um, maybe I didn't say it in a loving enough way. I don't know. Um, but in the case, Ruth years ago taught some women's classes, and uh, I didn't talk to you about this ahead of time, but it says own, your own husband. And you made a point out of that at the time. Let me see if I get it correctly. It's been a long time since we talked about it. But sometimes... If, if a man is working in a workplace and there's a woman um, as the boss, does, she have, does that boss have to submit to him because he's a man? Well, talking about, it's talking in the Bible about submitting to your own husband, not somebody else's husband. 
Um, it also that also does create some problems sometimes, right, Ruth, for women in the workplace who do have to submit to a boss who's a man, and he may want her to dress in a certain way, and maybe their husband at home. Even if he, I, mean, I don't mean he's a stay-at-home husband, but he, at home, he might say, I don't want you dressing that way for whatever reason. And so she's supposed to submit to her own husband and not to the boss as preference over what her own husband wants her to do as far as the way she's dressing or the way she pre, you know, presents herself or whatever. Rich? No, it's, it's, I, I, too, have talked to several people that say, you know, tell their wives... I think you do, um, or I tell you do. But you know, last time we went through this, this meant a lot to me cause, because you said line up under. Like we right. line up under Christ. Um, it's not a it's not a boss attitude. Right. It's an order. Not an order like a command. It's an order like a structure. Yeah. There has to be order. Uh, just like in a church, somebody has to make the final decision. If you've got a, if you've got a decision to make as a church, and you've got several people on the board or whatever, that, that somehow there's got to be a way. I mean, that's why even as a country we have we have laws, and ultimately it, things get solved in a certain way. And we have an argument. Eventually, it goes to the Supreme Court, and that's our way of solving a problem. People don't always agree with the decision, but you got to stop somewhere. So, uh, for in order to have a organized society but in order to have an organized home you know you have to have some kind of structure somebody's got to make the final decision if you've got a if you got a deadlock on what you should do and god has given the man that responsibility to be that person and some some women think well my husband is you know dumber than a doornail and and so what am i supposed to do well you know what you married him, yeah, maybe, you're, maybe you're dumber for marrying him, I don't know. All right, so anyway, wives submit to your own husbands, as is fitting, this, Colossians says, as is fitting, as is, as is appropriate in the Lord. God is a God of order. We, have a, we used to have a diagram, um, you know, you have God, and then the man submits to God, and the wife submits to the husband. It's an umbrella situation, kind of, you're... There, without going into a lot of detail, in the Old Testament, for example, there were, it was a protection thing, too. If a husband, in the Old Testament, if the husband found out, heard, that his wife, well, you know, generally with vows in the Old Testament, if you make a vow, you have to keep it. God says, I would, it's better not to make a vow than to vow it and not keep it. But there are passages in the Old Testament where the, under the law, he sa it says, if a husband hears his wife or hears of his, the fact that his wife has made a vow and it's a vow that he does not want her to make, he has the right to cancel that vow without punishment to her from God. So she made a vow and God says, if you make a vow, you got to pay. Well, except in this case, God himself gave the exception, if your husband intervenes, so he's a protection. You have God, you got the husband, you got the wife. So the <laughs> wife makes a vow over here to God, and he says, no, we're not doing that, and he's got this protecting umbrella over that. And the same thing with parents and children. If a child that's still under the authority of their parent makes a vow to God, and the dad or mom hears of it, they can cancel that vow when the child is still part of the family. Um, so it's a protection thing, um, and that's the way God has ordained it. Now people say, "Well, I don't like that." Well, a lot of things we might not like. Um, God's the one. God's the one in charge, so He gets to decide how it goes. Um, next verse, uh, Colossians three nineteen. Husbands, <clears throat> husbands, love your wives, and do not be bitter toward them. Now, as a husband, I find that interesting. It does never anywhere tell wives not to be bitter up to their husbands. It doesn't mean they can. I, I suspect that bitterness in that relationship is more prevalent and more potential in men. Because, um, I don't know why, but I think that 
um, a man, it, it seems to me, I, I mean, I'm 77 years old, so my, in my lifetime, in the way of thinking about these things and talking to people and sharing and so forth, it seems like men are more often bitter toward their wife than their wife toward them. Their, their wife might be angry toward their husband, but there might not, there's this bitterness thing um, seems to be something that can creep up in men. And uh, so we're not supposed to be bitter toward our wife. Roger, yes? The word bitter directly infers toxic poisonous. Yeah, and it's a, it's a, have you ever heard of picric acid? The Greek word has got picric in it. And picric acid is an actual acid. It's very, very, very bitter. Um, just bone tingling bitter. If you touch it a little bit with your tongue or whatever, it's just like, uh, you know. Um, and that's different than sour. Bitter is a different thing. Um, but we're not supposed to be, not to have that bitterness. It builds up in a person. It just, you know, you can be, you can be, a man can be at work fuming about something his wife is doing, and by the end of the day, he's got it worked up into this massive thing, and she's got no idea what's going to hit her when he gets home, um, because he took a little thing and got bitter about it, and now he's really angry and upset about something, and it was just some little slight of thing. Maybe she didn't do something exactly the way he wanted it to be done or something, and now all of a sudden she's a rebel and she's causing problems, and, um, you know. So that's something husbands are to be careful of. In, back in, in Ephesians 5, we're going to spend a little bit of time on this because this is such a long section. I'm not going to break it down into all kinds of detail here, but it's something important to look at. So um, verse 25, Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So that gives us the standard, guys. Um, love your wife. How? Like Christ loves the church. Okay, so so much for um, I'm in charge, I get to push my way around on the part of the husband. You know? You've know, got to love your wife like Christ loved the church. And the love here is agape. So if you go to, you go to Ephes or 1 Corinthians 13, you have that whole love, love hardly takes a note of anything wrong, doesn't keep lists. Um, but you have people, this is the fifth time I've had to tell you, you know, well, you're counting. Love doesn't count. Love doesn't say, um, I don't know why you've been this, you've been this way since I married you. I don't know why you're acting like this. Love doesn't do that. Um, love doesn't count all that stuff. Roger. Yeah. This comes up quite often in counseling, but the, and gave himself for it. Well, I'm willing to die for my wife. It's like, uh, Christ did more than that for the church. Right. His time, talents. Right. And, and dying, um, I think most Christian men would jump in front of a bullet for their wife. Um, but dying... Dying is more than actual physical dying. I mean, are we willing to, to die to self, um, to give up something we want to do in order to um, do something special for our wife? If our wife says um, the amount of time you're gone doing X, Y, or Z is too I just wish you were home more, and you can see it in her face. You're out hunting too much, working on your car too much, golfing too much, whatever list of things you might have. Um, are you willing to die to that? Are you willing to say, okay, uh, I'm only going to hunt this much from now on, or I'm only going to go golfing this much. I'm going to give up my hobby, sell my clubs, um, because my wife is grieved by how much time I'm spending with those guys at the golf course or whatever it is. You put a bunch of things in there. Um, a man who might be willing to jump in front of the bullet for his wife might not be willing to give up his weekly golf outing with his buddies. Yeah. Well, then you're not willing to die. The bullet's instantaneous, you know, and I think it, for me it would be a whole lot easier to jump in front of the bullet than to think about, oh, I got to be like this all the time. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. I, I think that it would be it's a long, it's a long stretch of dying. Yeah. <coughs> And then, then there's other ways. There's other ways to die, 
to pretend you're dying and then to make a point out of it. <laughs> I mean, you can give up your golf course. You can give up your golf. Let's say, let's say that was your thing, golfing, all right? And because of your wife's, your wife's concern about that, you give that up. So you can be sitting at breakfast and you're not going golfing today, but it's a beautiful day. It would be a golfing day. Your buddies are probably out there today. And what you can do, and you shouldn't do, you know where I'm going with this? You're not going to go golfing. I'll just tell you, that's not part of the scenario I'm describing. What's going to happen at breakfast? You're going to make sure she knows it. Yeah. You know, if I was still golfing, this is one of the days I bet Bob and Bill and Sam are really enjoying themselves out there. But I, I'm here for you. I'm here for you. Um, I'd be having fun, but now I'm not going to. Now it's not going to be as much fun, but I, I'm willing to sacrifice <laughs> for this uh, because I love you so much. I'm willing to be here. I don't know what I'm going to do today. I guess I'm just going to kind of hang around. Um, I could be out golfing. You know what I'm talking about? Um, so what have you just done? You've not died. You've come back to life again. You know, you're resurrected to the wrong side of things. Um, so anyway, we can make a big, you know, a lot, there's a lot going on here. Um, gave himself for her. Verse 26, we're in Ephesians 5, 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself. This is what Christ did, but we're supposed to be like Christ. A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So that's Christ's ministry to us, to sanctify, cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's what Christ did. So I take that to mean that as the husband, I am the priest, if you will, of the house, the pastor of the house as the man. And it's my job to minister to my wife. Minister can mean serve. I should serve my wife just generally in life, but serve my wife in this way to help with her sanctification, not by being a jerk so that she has to learn how to be more sanctified in her response, but to take the word of God and apply it in her life regularly and continuously and, and faithfully. It doesn't, that's not the same thing as saying, my wife got angry and I'm going to find the verse and show her. She better, you know, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the faithful, the faithful administration of the word. And nobody's perfect at this. None of us is perfect at this. But the faithful administration of the word and biblical principles to the wife and to the family so that, we're talking about husbands and wives, so that my wife can be a more beautifully spiritual person over time because of my efforts in the word, sprinkling her with the washing of the water of the word. That's what our job is as men, to do that. Um, it, is an, it is a fact of nature that women generally are more interested in spiritual things, lo, even lowercase spiritual, than men. Um, if you go to the big, the big picture, not just Christian picture, but the big picture, more women get sucked into cults even than men. That's not, a, that's not a, I'm not saying that to boast about being men, but that's the way it is. Women are more interested in spiritual things. If you read scripture, even, Paul talks about uh, wasting words like a bunch of silly women. That's not a cut down. It's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not a uh, sexist statement, although the world would tell you it was. But women have the tendency to be more spiritual. Well, in the Christian realm, that's true typically. Um, a story I've told often, maybe even to you before, but I was, I was, as a young married husband, Ruth one time said to me really early, early on, shouldn't we be praying together? And she wasn't trying to take the leadership. She was just questioning and I was like slain to my heart. She didn't do it. As, she didn't get out a sword and Argh. it wasn't that. She was just asking a question. And I'm going, oh my goodness, I've already failed on this. And we're like five days into the, wedding, in the marriage or whatever it was. 
um, and I, I wasn't doing my job. And why, why, why would the wife be the one to tell me that? And after we have kids, then um, maybe we should have the kids memorize some scripture, she said, things like that. Where am I? Why wouldn't I think about that? You know? And so women tend to do that, and that's not good. We men should take the leadership on these things and be the one to, in, to instigate, to start those kinds of discussions, those kinds of things in the family. That's what he's talking about here, I think. Um, that verse 27, that he might present her to himself, Jesus, present the church to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Well, the man's goal to, would be the same thing. In the, in, the, in the ministering to the wife, the word of God, the truth of scripture, the prayer life, and all of that stuff so that, you know, 50 years after you're married, you've got a more beautiful, spiritually uh, healthy wife than you did when you got married. That's, you want her to be that way. That's the men's job to do that, I think. Um, so verse 28, so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. So we... You know how we guys are, and women too. We, we cherish our own bodies. We make sure we look good and all that. Um, but he's basically saying, men, you know, you, you look after yourself. We'll look after your wife too, you know, better. Pay attention to those things. So I think that's what he's, that's what he's saying there. Um, back to Colossians. So wives, husbands, children. Uh, children, obey your parents in the Lord. The, uh, Ephesians says, as children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. right, good. In this verse in Colossians 3.20, he says, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. So we don't have any uh, actually young children here to um, give this message to, but that's the teaching. Children are supposed to obey their parents. That's the way it's supposed to work. Um, and as you know, most, a lot of us are grandparents. If we have an opportunity with our grandchildren and we see them disobeying their parents at some point, or maybe frequently, maybe not just one little thing, but if it seems to be a recurring thing, there's nothing wrong with a grandparent coming alongside the little kid and saying, when your mommy tells you something to do, you really need to be doing it. And grandpa and grandma are really concerned that you're not doing that, and you need to be listening to your parents. That's what God wants. God's will is that, and there's nothing wrong with doing that. And if it's really repetitious and you don't feel like your own children are teaching their children to obey them, some parents think it's, it's self-serving. Some, some parents think it's self-serving to get their, how, what, what right do I have to make my kids listen to me? Well, the Bible tells you that that's the way it's supposed to be. So you have that responsibility. Um, and so there's nothing wrong if you find the right opportunity or take the right opportunity, especially if it's a habitual thing, to pull your daughter aside, your son aside, and say, uh, you really need to get this under control. Johnny, keeps, you keep telling him to do things, and he doesn't do anything that you're telling him to do. And you need to figure this out and, and start working to make him obey you because right now he's only six or whatever but what happens when he's 18 or 17 or 16 that's not might not be a pretty picture you know we knew a guy a pretty big guy and he had little kids a couple of boys and it was pathetic he they he told him to pick up like the doctor's office or something pick up the stuff you've been playing with you know and put it and they wouldn't do it and he told me once he said i told him to sit in the chair and he wouldn't sit in the chair he wouldn't stay he sat down, but he got back up. And I'm thinking, you are way bigger than him. You know, you should be able to figure out a way to make him sit. Even if you pick him up off the floor and put him in the chair a hundred times. I said, sit on the chair. I said, sit on the chair. I mean, you can, there are ways to get this done. Um, but you need to start really early. You need to start early, yeah. It's hard to do that to a 16-year-old, I told you. Um, but yeah, start, it, it starts early. But you need to, it's part of, of being a faithful Christian because God's word says to children, obey your parents, and you're the one who has to teach them that. They're not going to know that on their own because children, just like all of us, are naturally rebellious and sinful. And uh, 
wasn't it David wrote, we, uh, we go astray from the womb, or I went astray from the womb, something like that. Uh, straight out of the womb. You know, pastor talks about that a lot. We've all cried and whined. One story about my, about my son uh, that shocked me as a young dad. He, he was sitting in his high chair. I don't know how old was Tim, five or four, or three. That wasn't, wasn't five. He was younger than five, I think. He had a high chair. You know, the high chairs have a place for your foot to, to land on the rest. So he was, he was sitting there at, at dinner, supper, whatever, and he, he wasn't disobedient at this point. He was just kicking. The kids love to make noise, and we adults have a hard time with noise. But he's just, he's just got this rhythm going, kicking. So there wasn't anything wrong with that. But I reached over, and I said, no, Tim, this, yeah, let's, let's just call that quits, you know. Let's just stop that. I held his legs, and he stopped with my legs. And as soon as I took my hand away, he looked me straight in the eye and went, one more time. And I thought, whoa, there's, there was an intentional, right, an intentional rebellion right there. It, and it was, it was a look, it was a defiant look. And I don't know, I don't know where he learned that from. I have no idea. Uh, but it was there. Pardon? Oh, yeah. There's that sin nature there. We all have it, right? Uh, and we do this, we as adults do the same thing in our own realm. A police officer says we, we need, we're speeding or whatever. Different things happen to us and we go, no, I, we're, we're going to resist. So anyway, we'll pick up there next week, Lord willing. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Um, your word is not just your truth. It's truth. And help us to believe it and follow it and uh, live a life that's pleasing to you, um, not out of law, but out of, out of the wonderful grace that you've given us and extended to us. Help us just to excel in pleasing you and in, in serving you because you are such a good and kind and gracious, faithful God. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.